good wishes to all of you. History of Modern India, Chapter 5, Administrative Organization and Social and Cultural Policy, Audiobook. We have seen in the previous chapter that by 1784, the East India Company's administration of India had been brought under the control of the British government and that its economic policies were being determined by the needs of the British economy. We will now discuss the organization through which the company administrated its recently acquired dominion. In the beginning, the company left the administration of its positions in India in Indian hands, confining its activities to supervision, but it soon found that British aims were not advocately served by following old methods of administration. Consequently, the company took some aspects of administration into its own hands. Under Warren Hastings and Cornwallis, the administration at the top was overhauled and the foundations of a new system based on the English pattern laid. The spread of British power to new areas, new problems, new needs, new experiences and new ideas led in the 19th century to more fundamental changes in the system of administration. But the overall objectives of imperialism were never forgotten. The British administration in India was based on three pillars, the civil services, the army and the police. This was so for two reasons. For one, the chief aim of British Indian administration was the maintenance of law and order and the perpetuation of British rule. Without law and order, British merchants and British manufacturers could not hope to sell their goods in every nook and corner of India. Again, the British being foreigners could not hope to win the affections of the Indian people that therefore relied on superior force rather than on public support for the maintenance of their control over India. The Duke of Wellington, who had several in India under his brother Lord Wellesley, remarked after his return to Europe. The system of government in India, the foundation of authority and the modes of supporting in it and of carrying on the operations of government are entirely different from the systems and modes adopted in Europe for the same purpose. The foundation and the instruments of all power three, uh, there is this word, civil services. The civil services was brought into extension by Lord Cornwallis, As we have seen in the earlier chapter, the East India Company had from the beginning carried on its trade in the East through servants who were paid low wages but who were permitted to trade privately. Later, when the company became a territorial power, the same servants assumed administrative functions. They now became extremely corrupt by oppressing local weavers and artisans, merchants and zamindars by extorting bribes and gifts from rajas and nawabs by include, indulging in illegal private trade. They amassed and told wealth with the, which they retired to England. Clive and Warren Hastings made attempts to put, uh, put an end to their corruption but were only partially successful. Cornwallis, who came to India as Governor General in 18, uh, 1786, was determined to purify the administration, but he realized that the company servants would not give honest and efficient servants so long as they were not paid advocate salaries. He therefore enforced the rules against private trade and acceptance of presents and bribes by officials with strictness. At the same time, he raised the salaries of the company servants for example, the collector of a district was to, to be paid Rs. 1500 a month and 1% commission on the revenue collection of his district. In fact, the company's civil service became the highest paid service in the world. Cornwallis also laid down that a promotion in the civil service would, buy, would be by seniority so that its members would remain independent of outside influence. In 1800, Lord Wellesley established the College of Fort William at Calcutta for the education of young recruits to the civil service. The directors of the company disapproved of his action and in 1806 replaced it by their own East Indian college at Halebury in England. Till 1853, all appointments to the civil services were made by the directors of the East India Company who placated the members of the board of control by letting them make some of the nominations. The directors fought hard to retain his uh, eucarative and prizer privileges and refused to surrender it even when their other economic and political privileges were taken away by parliament.
They lost it finally in 15, 1853 when the Charter Act decreed that all recruits to the civil service were to be selected through a competitive examination. A special feature of the Indian civil services since the days of Cornwallis was the resident complete exclusion of Indians from it. It was laid down officially in 1793 that all higher posts in administration were more than 500 euros a year in salary were to be held by Englishmen. This policy was also applied to other branches of government such as the army, police, judiciary, engineering. In the words of John Shore, who succeeded Cornwallis, the fundamental principle of the English have been to make the whole Indian nation subservient in every possible way to the interests and benefits of ourselves. The Indians have been excluded from every honor, dignity or office which the lowest Englishmen could be prevailed to accept. Why did the British follow such a policy? Many factors combined to produce it. For one, they were convinced that an administration based on British ideas, institutions and practices could be firmly established only by English personnel. And then they did not trust the ability and integrity of the Indians. For example, Charles Grant, chairman of the court of directors, condemned the people of India as a race of men, lambality, disunited and base, retaining but a feeble sense of moral obligation and sunk, it, sunk in mystery by their vices. Similarly, Cornwallis believed that every native of Hindustan is corrupt. It may be noted that this criticism did apply to some extent to a small class of Indian officials and zamindars of the time. But then, it was equally if not more, tr more true of British officials in India. In fact, Cornwallis had proposed to give them high salaries in order to help them resist temptations and to become, uh, to become honest and obedient. But he never thought of applying the same remedy of advocate salaries to eradicate corruption among Indian officials. In reality, the exclusion of Indians from higher grades of the services was a deliberate policy. These services were required at the time to establish the consolidated British rule in India. Obviously, the task could not be left to Indians who did not possess the same initiative sympathy for and understanding of British interests as Englishmen. Moreover, the influential classes of British society were keen to preserve the monopoly of lucrative appointments, appointments in the Indian civil services and other services for their sons. In fact, the fourth tooth and nail among themselves over those these appointments. The right to make them was a perpetual bone of contention between the directors of the company and the members of the British cabinet. How could the English then agree to let Indians occupy these posts? Indians were, however, recruited in large numbers to fill subordinate posts as they were cheaper and much more readily available than Englishmen. The Indian civil services gradually developed into one of the most efficient and powerful civil services in the world. Its members exercised vast power and often participated in the making of policy. They developed certain traditions of independence, integrity and hard work. So these qualities obviously served British and not Indian interests. They came to believe that they had an almost divine right to rule India. The Indian civil services has been has often been called the steel frame which reared and sustained British rule in India. In course of time, it became the chief opponent of all that was progressive and advanced in Indian life and one of the main targets of attacks by the rising Indian national movement. Army. The second important pillar of the British regum in, regime in India was the army. It fulfilled four important functions. It was the instrument through which the Indian powers were reconquered. It defended the British Empire in India from foreign rivals. It safeguarded British. supermassive from the ever present threat of internal revolt and it was uh, the chief instrument for extending and defending the British Empire in Asia and Africa. The bulk of the company's army consisted of Indian soldiers recruited chiefly from the area at present included in UP and Bihar. For instance, in 1857, the strength of the army in India was 3,11,400 of whom 2,65,900 were Indians. Its officers were, however, exclusively British, at least since the days of Cornwalls.
In 1856, only three Indians in the army received a salary of Rs. 300 per month and the highest Indian officer was a Subedar. A large number of Indian troops had to be employed as British troops were far too expensive. Moreover, the population of Britain was perhaps too small to provide the large soldiery needed for the conquest of India. As a counterweight, the army was offi officered entirely by British officials and a certain number of British troops were maintained to keep the Indian soldiers under control. Even so, it appears surprisingly today than a handful of foreigners could conquer and control India with a predominantly Indian army. This was possible because of two factors. On the one hand, there was an absence of modern nationalism in the country at the time. A soldier from Bihar or Avad did not think and could not, could not have thought that in helping the company defeat the Marathas or the Punjabis. He was being anti-Indian. On the other hand, the Indian soldier had a long tradition of loyalty to the salt. In other words, the Indian soldier was a good mercenary and the company on its part was a good paymaster. It paid its soldiers regularly and well, something that the Indian rulers and chieftains were no longer doing. Police The third pillar of British rule was the police, whose creator was once again Cornwells. Cornwallis. He relieved the zamindars of their police functions and established a regular police force to maintain law and order. In this respect, he went back to and modernized the old Indian system of Thanas. This put India ahead of Britain, where the system of police had not developed yet. Cornwallis established a system of circles or Thanas headed by Daroga, who was an Indian. Later, the post of the District super, uh, Superintendent of Police was created to head the police organization in the district. Once again, Indians were excluded from all superior posts in the villages. The duties of the police continued to be performed by village watchmen who were maintained by the villagers. The police gradually succeeded in reducing major crimes such as decoity. The police also prevented the organization of a large-scale conspiracy against foreign control. And when the national movement arose, the police was used to suppress it. In its dealings with the people, the Indian police adopted an unsympathetic attitude. A committee of parliament reported in 1813 that the police committed depredations on the peaceful inhabitants of the same nature as those practiced by the dacoits whom they were employed to suppress. And William Bentick, the governor general, wrote in 1832, as for the police, so far from being a protection to the people. I cannot better illustrate the public feeling regarding it than by the following fact that nothing can ex exceed the popularity of a recent re regulation by which, if a robbery has been committed, the police are prevented from making any inquiry into it, except upon the request of the person's robber, that is to say, the shepherd is a more uh, Ravenous beast of prey than the wolf. Judicial organization. The British laid the foundations of a new system of dispensing justice through a herchery of civil and criminal courts. Although it was started by Warren Hastings, the system was stabilized by Cornwallis in 1793. In each district was established a Diwani Adalt or civil court presided over by the district judge who belonged to the civil service. Cornwallis thus separated the posts of the civil judge and the collector appealed from the district court lay first to four provincial courts of civil appeal, appeal and then finally to the Sardar Tibani Adalat. Below the district court were registered courts headed by Europeans and a number of subordinate, subordinate courts headed by Indian judges known as uh, Munsifs and Amins. To deal with the criminal cases, Cornwall's uh, Cornwallis divided the presidents of Bengal into four divisions, in each of which a court of a circuit presided over by the civil servants was established. Below these courts came a large number of Indian magistrates to try petty cases. Appeals from the courts of a circuit lay with her. Southern Nizamat Adalat, the criminal courts applied Muslim criminal law in a modified and less harsh form so that the tearing apart of limbs and such other punishments were prohibited. The civil courts appealed the customary law that had prevailed in any area or among a section of the people since time immemorial. 
In 1831, William William Bentinck abolished the provincial courts of appeal and the circuit. Their work was assigned first to commissions and later to district judges and district collectors. Bentinck also raised the status and powers of Indians in the judicial service and appointed them as deputy magistrates, subordinate judges, and principal sadar amins. In 1865, high courts were established at Calcutta, Madras, and Bombay to replace the sadar courts of Diwan and Nizamat. The British also established a new system of law, laws through the process of enactment and confiscation of old laws. The traditional system of justice in India had been largely based on customary law, which arose from long tradition and practice. So many laws were based on the shastras and the shariat as well as on imperial authority. So they continued to observe customary law in general. The British gradually evolved a new system of laws. They introduced the regulations, codified the existing laws, and often systematized and modernized them through judicial interpretation. The Charter Act of eighteen thirty-three conferred all law-making power on the Governor General in Council. All this means that Indians were now to live increasingly under man-made laws, which might be good or bad, but which had to be obeyed blindly and which could be no. not be questioned as they were supposed to be divine and therefore sacred in 1833 the government appointed a law commission headed by lord macaulay to codify indian laws its labors eventually resulted in the indian penal code the western derived codes of civil and criminal pro- procedure and other codes of laws the same laws now prevailed all over the country and they were enforced by a uniform system of courts Thus, it may be said that India was judicially unified. The rule of law. The British introduced at the modern concept of the rule of law. This meant that their administration was to be carried out, at least in theory, in obedience to laws which clearly defined the rights, privileges, and obligations of the subjects, and not according to the caprice or personal discretion of the ruler. In practice, of course. the bureaucracy and the police enjoyed a arbitrary powers and interfered with the rights and liberties of the people the rule of law was to some extent a guarantee of the personal liberty of a person it is true that previous uh, rulers of india had been in general bound by tradition and custom but they always had the legal right to take any administrative steps they wanted and there existed no other authority before whom their acts could be questioned The Indian rulers and chiefs sometimes exercised this power to do as they wanted. Under British rule, on the other hand, administration was largely carried on according to laws as interpreted by the courts. Though the laws themselves were often defective, were made not by the people through a democratic process but aut- autocratically by the foreign rulers, and left a great deal of power in the hands of the civil servants and the police. But that was perhaps inevitable in a foreign regime that could not in the very nature of things be democratic or libertarian equality before law the indian legal system under the british was based on the concept of equality before law this meant that in the eyes of the law all men were equal the same law applied to all persons irrespective of their caste religion or class previously the judicial system had paid heed to caste distinctions and had differentiated between the so called high born and low born for the same time lighter punishment was awarded to a brahmin than to a non brahmin similarly in practice zamindars and nobles were not judged as harshly as the commoner in fact very often they could not be brought to justice at uh, all the all for their actions now the humble could also move the machinery of justice there was however one exception to this excellent principle of equality before law the europeans and their descendants had separate courts and even laws in criminal cases they could be tried only by european judges many english officials military officers planters and merchants behaved with the indians in a haughty harsh and even brutal manner when efforts were made to bring them to justice they were given indirect and unjust protection and consequently light or no punishment by many of the european judges before whom alone they could be tried consequently there was frequent term miscarriages of justice in practice there emerged another type of legal inequality justice became quite extensive as court fees 
had to be paid. Lawyers engaged in the expenses of witness met. Courts were often situated in distant towns. Lawsuits dragged on for years. The complicated laws were beyond the grasp of the illiterate and ignorant peasants. Invariably, the rich could turn and twist the laws and courts to operate in their own power. The mere theatre to take a poor person through the long process of justice from the lower court to the highest court of appeal and thus to face him with a complete trial, often sufficed to bring him to hell. Moreover, the widespread prevalence of corruption in the ranks of the police and the rest of the administrative machinery led to the denial of justice. Officials often favored the rich, the zamindars oppressed the rights without fear of official action. In contrast, the system of justice that had prevailed in pre-British times was comparatively informal, speedy, and inextensive. Thus, while the new judicial system marked a great step forward in so far as it was based on the laudable principles of the rule of law and equality before the law, and on rational and human made man-made laws, it was a retrograde step in some other respects. It was now costlier and involved long delays. Social and Cultural Policy We have seen that British authorities reorganized and regulated India's economy in the interests of British trade and industry and organized a modern administrative system to guarantee order and security. Till 1813, they also followed a policy of non-interference in the religious, social and cultural life of the country. But after 1813, they took active steps to transform India's society and culture. This followed the rise of new interests and new ideas in Britain during the 19th century. The Industrial Revolution which had begun in the middle of the 18th century and the consequent growth of industrial capitalism were fast changing all aspects of British society. The rising industrial interest wanted to turn India to, into a big market for their goods. This could not be accomplished by, merely by adhering to the policy of keeping peace and required the partial transformation and modernization of Indian society. And so, in the words of the historians Thompson and Garath, the mood and methods of the old brigandic were changing into those of modern industrialism and capitalism. Science and technology also opened new vistas of human progress. The 18th and 19th centuries witnessed a great ferment of new ideas in Britain and Europe, which influenced the British outlook towards Indian problems. All over Europe, new attitudes of mind, manners, and morals were appearing. The Great French Revolution of 1789, with its message of liberty, equality, and fraternity, generated powerful democratic sentiments and unleashed the force of modern nationalism. In the realm of thought, the new trend was represented by Bacon, Locke, Voltaire, Prosok, Kant, Adam Smith, and Bentham. In the realm of literature by Wordsworth, Byron, Shelley, and Charles Dickens, the impact of the new thought, the product of the intellectual revolution of the 18th century, the French Revolution and the Industrial Revolution was naturally felt in India and to some extent affected the official notions of government. The three outstanding characteristics of the new thought were rationalism or faith in reason and silence, sorry, reason and science, humanism or love of man, and confidence in the capacity of man to progress. The rational and scientific attitude indicated that only that which was in conformity with the human reason and capable of being tested in practice was true. The scientific progress of the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries and the tremendous power of production released by the application of science to industry were visible proofs of the power of human reason. Humanism was based on the belief that every human being was an end in himself and should be respected and prized as such. No man had the right to took a look upon another human being as a mere agent of his own happiness. The humanistic outlook gave birth to the doctrines of individualism, liberalism, and socialism. According to the doctrine of progress, all societies must change with time. Nothing was or could be static. Moreover, man had the capacity to remodel nature and society on rational and just lines. The new currents of thoughts in Europe came into conflict with the old outlook and produced a clash of attitudes among those who determined Indian policy or 
run the inner administration the older attitude known as the uh, conservative or traditional attitude believed in making a few changes in India as possible. The early representatives of this attitude were Warren Hastings and Edmund Burke, the famous writer and parliamentarian, and the later ones included the famous officials Munro, Malcolm, Elphinstone, and Metcalfe. The con uh, conservatives maintained that uh, India's civilization was uh, different from European civilization but was not necessarily inferior to it. Many of them respected and admired Indian philosophy and culture, realizing that it might be necessary to introduce some Western ideas and practices. They proposed to introduce them very cautiously and gradually. Favoring social stability above all, they opposed any program of rapid change, sweeping or hasty innovations. They felt would produce a violent reaction in the country. The conservative outlook remained influential in England as well as in India up to the very end of British rule. In fact, the majority of British officials in India were generally of conservative persuasion. By 1800, the conservative attitude was fast giving way to a new attitude which was sharply critical of Indian society and culture. Indian civilization was condemned as a static. It was looked down upon with a contempt. Indian customs were considered uncivilized, Indian institutions corrupt and decadent, and Indian though narrow and unscientific. This critical approach was used by most officials and writers and statesmen of Britain to justify the political and economic enslavement of India and to proclaim that it was incapable of improvement and must therefore remain permanently under British title. However, a few Englishmen known as uh, radicals went beyond this narrow criticism and imperialistic uh, outlook and applied the advanced humanistic and rational thought of the West to the Indian situation as they saw it. The doctrine of reason led them to believe that India need not always be a fallen country, for all societies had the capacity to improve by following the dictates of reasons and science. The doctrine of humanism led them to describe the improvement of Indian people. The doctrine of progress led them to the conviction that Indians were bound to improve. And so the radicals, though few better representing the better elements of British society, decided to make India a part of the modern progressive world of science and humanism. To them, the answer to India's ill appeared to lie in the introduction of the modern Western sciences, philosophy and literature, in fact. In all out and rapid change along modern lines, some of the officials who came to India in the 1820s and after were deeply influenced by the radical outlook. It must, however, be emphasized at this state, at this stage, that uh, such honest and philanthropic Englishmen were few and that their influence was never decisive so far as the British administration of India was concerned. The ruling elements in British India administration continued to be imperialistic and uh, exploitative. They would accept new ideas and adopt reformist measures only if and to the extent that they did not come into conflict with the commercial interest and profit motives and enable the economic penetration of India and the consolidation of a British rule. Modernization of India had to occur within the broad limits imposed by the needs of easier and a more through exploitation of its resources, as the modernization of India was accepted by many English officials, businessmen and statesmen because it was accepted to make uh, India's bitter customers for British goods and reconcile them to the alien rule. In fact, many of the radios themselves no longer remained true to their own beliefs when they discussed India policy instead of working for a democratic government as they did in Britain. They demanded a more authoritarian rigam, which they described as paternalistic. In this respect, they were at one with the conservatives who were also ardent champions of a paternism that uh, would treat the Indian people as children and keep them out of the administration. The basic dilemma before the British administrators in India was that uh, while British interests in India could not be Service without some 
modernization full modernization would generate forces with a would go against their interests and would in a long run endanger british supremacy in the country they had therefore to follow a delicately balanced policy of a partial modernization that is a policy of introducing modernization in some respects and blocking and preventing it in others in other words the modernization of india was to be colonial modernization carried out with a parameters of and with a view to promoting promoting colonialism the policy of modernization modernizing indian society and culture was also encouraged by christian missionaries and religious minded persons such as william wilberforce and charles grant the chairman of the court of districts of the east india company who wanted to spread christianity in india they too adopted a critical attitude towards indian society but on religious grounds they passionately believed that uh, christianity alone was the true religion and that all other religions were false they supported to they supported a program of westernization in the hope that it would eventually lead to the country's uh, conversion to christianity they thought that the light of western knowledge would destroy people's faith in their own religions and lead them to welcome and embrace christianity they therefore opened modern schools colleges and hospitals in the country the missionaries were however often the most unwilling allies of the rationalist radi- radicals whose scientific approach undermined not only hindu or muslim mythology but christian mythology as well a professor h h dodwell has pointed out taught to question the validity of their own gods they the westernized indians question also the validity of the bible of the bible and the truth of its narrative the missionaries also supported the paternalistic uh, imperialistic policies since they looked upon law and order to order and british supremacy as essential for their work of religious propaganda they also sought the support of british merchants and manufacturers by holding out the hope that a christian converts would be better customers for their goods the radicals were given strong support by raja ramohan rai and other like minded indians who were conscious of the low caste who were conscious of the low state to which their country and society had sunk who were sick of caste prejudices and other social evils and who believed that the salvation of india lay in science and humanism we will discuss the outlook and activities of these indians at length in the next chapter another reason why the government of india followed a policy of cautious and gradual innovation and not that of all out modernization was the continuous prevalence of the conservative outlook among british officials in india and the belief that interference in india religious beliefs and social customs might lead to be rebellion among the indian people even the most ardent radicals uh, paid heed to this warning for along with the other members of the british governing classes they too decide most of all the safety and perpetuation of british rule in india every other consideration was of secondary importance as a matter of fact the policy of a hastened and weak modernization was gradually abandoned after 1858 as indians proved at pupils shifted rapidly towards modernization of their society and assertion of their culture and demanded to be ruled in accordance with the modern principles of liberty equality and nationality the british increasingly withdrew their support from the reformers and gradually came to say, side with the socially orthodox and conservative elements of society they also encouraged casteism and communalism humanitarian measures officials official british or efforts at uh, reforming indian society of its abuses were on the whole very meager and therefore bore little fruit their biggest achievement was the outla- outlying of the practice of sati in 1829 when william bentick made it a crime to associate in any way with her burning of a window on her hands pre- pyre earlier the british rulers had been apathetic and afraid of arousing the anger of the orthodox indians it was only after ramohan rai and other 
enlightened Indians and missionaries agitated persistently for the abolition of this monstrous custom that the government agreed to take this humanitarian step. Many Indian rulers in the past, including Akbar and Aurangzeb the Peshwas and Jaising of Jaipur, had made unsuccessful attempts to suppress this evil practice. In any case, Bentik deserves praise for having acted resolutely in outlawing a practice which had taken a toll of 800 lives in Bengal alone between 1815 and 1818, and were refusing to bow in, uh, before the opposition of the orthodox supporters of the practice of sati. Female infanticide or the practice of killing female children at the time of their birth had prevailed among some of the Rajput clans and other castes because of the paucity of young men who died in large numbers in warfare and because of the difficulties of earning a livelihood in unfertile areas and in parts of western and central India because of the prevalence of the evil custom of dowry in a virulent form. Regulations prohibiting infanticide had been passed in 1795 and 1802, but they were sternly enforced only by Bentick and Hardling. In 1856, the government of India passed an act enabling Hindu widows to remarry. The government acted after Pandit Ishwar Chandra Vidya Sagar and other reformers carried on a prolonged agitation in favor of the measure. The immediate effects of this act were negligible. All these officious reforms touched no more than the fringes of the Indian social system and did not affect the lives of the vast majority of the people. It was perhaps not possible for the foreign government to do more. Spread of modern education The British were more successful in the introduction of modern education. Of course, the spread of modern education was not solely the work of the government. The Christian missionaries and a large number of enlightened Indians also played an important part. For the first 60 years of its dominance in India, the East India Company, a trading profit-making concern, took little interest in the education of its subjects. There were, however, two very minor exceptions to this policy. In 1781, Warren Hastings set up the Calcutta Madras for the study and teaching of Muslim law and related subjects, and in 1791, Jonathan Duncan started a Sanskrit college at Varanasi, where he was the resident for the study of Hindu law and philosophy. Both these institutions were designed to provide a regular supply of qualified Indians to help the administration of law in the course of the company. Missionaries and their supporters and many humanitarians soon began to accept uh, pressure on the company to encourage and promote modern, secular, westernized education in India. While the humanitarians, including many Indians, believed that modern knowledge would be the best remedy for the social, economic and political ills of the country, the missionaries believed that modern education would destroy the faith of the people in their own religious and lead them to adopt Christianity. A humble beginning was made in 1813 when the Charter Act incorporated the principle of encouraging learned Indians and promoting the knowledge of modern sciences in the country. The act directed the company to spend the sum of one, one lakh of rupees for the purpose. But even this petty amount was not made available by company authorities till 1823. For years, a great controversy racked in the country on the question of the direction that this expansion should take. While one section of opinion wanted it to be spent exclusively for the promotion of modern western studies others desired that while western sciences and literature should be taught to prepare students to take up jobs emphasis should be placed on the expansion of traditional indian learning even among those who wanted to spread western learning differences arose on the question of the medium of instruction to be adopted in modern schools and colleges some recommended the use of indian languages called vernaculars at the time for the purpose while others advocated the use of English. Unfortunately, there was a great deal of confusion on this question. Many people failed to distinguish between English as a medium and English as a subject for study and between Indian languages as medical sorry media and traditional Indian learnings as the main object of study. 
The two controversies were settled in 1835 when the government of India decided to devote the limited resources it was willing to spare to the teaching of Western sciences and literature through the medium of English language alone. Lord Malachy, Macaulay, who was a law member of the Governor General's Council, argued in the famous minute that uh, India languages were not sufficiently developed to serve, serve the purpose and that uh, Oriental learning was completely inferior to European learning. It is to be noted that while Macaulay's views betrayed prejudice against uh, and ignorance of India's past achievements in the realms of science and thought. He was on solid ground when he held European knowledge in the fields of physical and social sciences to be superior to the existing Indian knowledge which uh, though advanced at one time had stagnated too long and lost touch with the reality. That is why the most advanced Indians of the time led by Raja Ramohan Roy fervently advocated the study of Western knowledge which was seen by them as the key to the treasure treasures of scientific and democratic thought of the modern West. They also realized that traditional education had bred superstition, fear and authoritarianism. In other words, they realized that the salvation of the country lay in going forward and not in looking backwards. In fact, no prominent Indian of the 19th and 20th centuries deviated from this approach. Moreover, throughout the period of modern history, the pressure exerted by Indians anxious to imbibe Western knowledge played an important part in persuading the government to expand its uh, educational activities on modern lines. The government of India acted quickly, particularly in Bengal, on the decision of 1835 and made English the medium of instructions in its schools and colleges. It opened a few English schools and colleges instead of a large number of elementary schools. This policy was later sharply criticized for neglecting the education of the masses. In fact, the emphasis on the opening of institutes of modern and higher education was not wrong. If for nothing else, a large number of schools and colleges were needed to educate and train teachers for elementary schools. But along with the spread of higher education, the education of the masses should have been taken in hand. This is, this the government would not do do so, it was not willing to spend more than an insignificant sum on education. To make up for the paucity of expenditure on education, the officials took a recourse to the so-called downward filtration theory. Since the allocated funds could educate only a handful of Indians, it was decided to spend the money in educating a few persons from the upper and middle classes who were accepted to assume the task of educating the masses and spreading modern ideas among them. Education and modern ideas were thus supposed to filter or radiate downwards from the upper classes. This policy continued until the very end of the British rule. It may also be pointed out here that even though education did not percolate downwards, modern ideas did, did to a large extent, though not in the form desired by the rulers. To political parties, the press, pamphlets, literature, and a public platform, to not throw schools and textbooks at the educated Indians or the intellectuals spread in ideas of democracy, nationalism, anti imperialism, and social and economic equality and justice among the rural and urban masses. If the educational system acted as the carrier of these ideas, it did so indirectly by making available to its recipients some of the basic literature in the physical and social sciences and the humanities thus uh, stimulated their capacity to make uh, social analysis. Otherwise, its structure and pattern aims, methods, curricula and content were all designed to serve colonialism. The Woods uh, dispatch the Woods dispatch the document dispatcher from the Court of Directions and popularly named after Sir Charles Wood, President of the Board of Control of 1854, was another important step in the development of education in India. The dispatch asked the government of India to assume responsibility for the education of the masses. 
it thus reputed the downward filtration theory at least on paper in practice the government did little to spread education and spent very little on it as a result of the directions given by the dispatch departments of education were instituted in all provinces and affiliating universities were set up in 1857 at calcutta bombay and madras bakim chandra chatterjee the famous bengali novelist became in 1858 one of the first two graduates of calcutta university for all the loud claims that it made the government of india under the company and later under the crown did not really take serious interest in spreading western learning or any other learning in india even the limited effort that was made was the result of factors which had little to do with the philanthropic motives of some importance in this respect was the aggression in favor of modern education by progressive indians foreign christian missionaries and humanitarian officials and other englishmen but the most important reason was the government's anxiety to economize on the cost of administration by getting a cheap supply of educated indians to man the large and increasing number of subordinate posts in administration and british business concerns it was main fastly too close too costly and perhaps not even possible to import enough englishmen for the purpose this emphasis on the cheap supply of clerks explains why the schools and colleges had to impart a modern education which fitted its recipients for their jobs in the westernized administration of the company and why these institutions had to emphasize english which was the language of the masters as well as the language of administration another motive behind the education policy of the british sprang from the belief that educated indians would help to expand the market for british manufactures in india lastly western education was accepted to reconcile the people of india to british rule particularly as it glorified the bengal conquests of india and their administration markley for example laid down we must at present do our best to form a class who may be interpreters between us and the millions whom we govern a class of persons indians is blood and color but english in taste in opinion in morals and in intellectual uh, the british thus wanted to use modern education to strengthen the foundation of their political authority in the country the traditional indian system of education gradually withered away from away for lack of official support and even more because of the official announcement in 1844 that applicants for government employment should possess a knowledge of english this declaration made english medium schools very popular and compelled more and more students to abandon the abandon the traditional schools a major weakness of the educational system was the neglect of mass education with the result that mass literacy in india was hardly better in 1911 and 92% in 1921 the emphasis on english as the medium of instruction in place of the indian languages also prevented the spread of education to the masses it further tended to create a wide linguistic and cultural gulf between educated persons and the masses moreover because students had to pay fees in schools and colleges education was quite costly and became a virtual monopoly of the richer classes and the city dwellers for nearly 100 years it was so very limited that it failed even to compensate for the ruin of the traditional educational system a major lacuna in the early education policy was the almost total neglect of the education of rights education of girls for which no funds were allotted this was partly due to the government's anxiety not to hurt the susceptibilities of orthodox indians even more it was because female education lacked immediate usefulness in the eye of the 
foreign officials since women could not be employed as clerk in the government the result was that atleta atletas 1921 only one uh, only two out of 100 indian women were able to read and write and in 1919 only 490 girls were studying in the four group four top forms of home high schools in the bengal presidency the company's administration also neglected scientific and technical education by 1857 there were only there was only one good engineering college at roorkee to impart a higher technical education and even this was open only to europeans and eurasians at the root of many of these weaknesses lay the problem of finance the government was never willing to spend more than a scanty sum on education as late as 1886 it evolved devoted only about the 1 crore of rupees to education out of its total net revenue of nearly rs 47 crores thank you